As we come on the air tonight, you are taking a live look at the House floor, where they're about to take the first gun reform votes since that horrific massacre in Uvalde. As a survivor of that shooting, just 11 years old, delivered a wrenching gut punch in new testimony today, describing how she smeared herself with a classmate's blood to play dead, to stay alive. Even lawmakers in tears. But will the emotional words of these survivors, of parents of victims, and of more people be enough to move the needle? We've got your reality check in just a minute. Plus, the man who said he came here to the D.C. area to kill Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh, now facing an attempted murder charge. The new details tonight on how police managed to stop him outside the justice's home. And an NBC News exclusive for you, the Biden administration taking a page out of a Republican governor's playbook, sending migrants to cities deeper inside the country. I'll tell you why they're doing it. Plus, a bombshell lawsuit from 90 gymnasts now suing the FBI over how it handled their sex abuse claims. I'll tell you why the athlete's lawyer says the FBI should pay out more than a billion dollars. And we're teeing up tomorrow's primetime public hearing on the January 6th insurrection with a look at how we got from that day to now and the latest on what to expect in just 24 hours later in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie. And it's totally possible that if you don't live in Uvalde, let's say, you may have mostly settled back into the rhythms of your everyday life, doing your thing at work, with your family, as more time has gone by since the shock and horror of what happened in that Texas town a few weeks ago, the massacre of 19 little kids and their two teachers. But today, the brutality those children faced, the reality of their stolen lives is fresh again for all of us, with testimony that just ripped out hearts on Capitol Hill from survivors and from victims' families of not just that shooting, but from others. There was that story from Uvalde fourth grader Mia Cerillo explaining what happened after the shooter came into her classroom that day at Robb Elementary, how she covered herself with her dead classmate's blood and pretended to be dead herself. It's hard to hear. It's impossible to hear. And here's the thing. Even if you've already heard that today, if you've seen it online or whatever, I'm going to ask you to listen to it one more time. Then he shot the little window, and then he went to the other classroom, and then he went, there's a door between our classrooms, and he went to there and shot my teacher and told my teacher goodnight and shot her in the head. And then he shot some of my classmates and the whiteboard. When I went to the backpacks, uh, he shot my friend that was next to me, and I thought he was going to come back to the room, so I grabbed the blood and I put it all on me. It's hard to hear, but it is essential to hear. And so is this, the parents of 10-year-old Lexi Rubio, Kimberly and Felix Rubio, reliving their own trauma giving us the excruciating TikTok of how they tried to find their daughter that day, expecting to find her on one of the buses full of evacuated students, checking local hospitals, and waiting outside the school before they heard the worst possible news. San Antonio firefighter eventually gave us a ride back to the Civic Center, where the district was asking all families who had not been reunited with their children to gather. Soon after, we received the news that our daughter was among the 19 students and two teachers that died as a result of gun violence. Somewhere out there, there is a mom listening to our testimony, thinking, I can't even imagine their pain, not knowing that our reality will one day be hers. And every one of these awful stories. And by the way, the fact that there are so many stories is telling in and of itself. But every one of these awful stories ended in a similar way, basically begging Congress to do something, to do something different from what they've done or not done before. And right now, that's still an open question. We talked about how the House, as we speak, is voting on a bunch of gun proposals, including one that would raise the age to buy a semi-automatic semi weapon from 18 to 21. That's probably going to pass on party lines, but it's going to hit a brick wall in the Senate, meaning it's not going to become law, most likely. So then what is next for those families, for this country? Let me bring in Ali Vitale now, live for us on Capitol Hill. And Ali, I spoke with one of the lawmakers who is in the room for this hearing today, who said the agony yeah was palpable. Like, it was, it was the, a physical sense of agony as these people relived their trauma for lawmakers to try to convince them to change their minds. 
Yeah, that's exactly what our colleagues in the room said as well. You saw lawmakers holding back tears. I know all of us who have been listening and watching all day have been doing the same, sometimes unsuccessfully holding back tears, because these are the most raw and gut-punching of stories that can be shared in these halls. And you're right that they all end in the same way, asking people to do something. Those conversations are ongoing now, but this hearing was so visceral, both in the remembrances of the parents, of the one student herself, you just heard her, fourth grader telling what it was like to be in that room as she watched her friends and her teacher killed by a man with a gun who came into their classroom. The fact that there are so many, I think you're right. We would, didn't just hear from people who were impacted by Uvalde. We heard from people who were impacted by Buffalo just a week prior to that. There are so many of these stories to share. The hope on the part of the committee is that by sharing them in such a visceral and raw way, it can jog this conversation that has been so mired in partisanship. On the other hand, we've seen moments like this before and not seen change. So this is really an open question of if right now is different. And that's the question is, like, what is the level of optimism that people should feel? Because yeah. after the Sandy Hook massacre, people know about what happened then, right? Calls for change, nothing happened. Same after a series of other shootings, El Paso, the Las Vegas mass shooting, Dayton, that yeah. shooting there. We saw, again, talks talks that ultimately collapse. So where do the talks now stand, Allie? Because the key focus is not really what's what we've showed live already in the show, which is this vote that's going to be happening on the House floor. Because again, yeah. this is not me being like a cynical political reporter. This is just the reality. That is not going to go anywhere in the Senate, almost certainly. What the focus yeah. is on now are those talks on the Senate side. More modest proposals here, including, for example, expanding background checks to include juvenile records for younger gun buyers, et cetera. Do you think we'll know more by the end of the week on where things stand on that front, Allie? Yeah, that's really the open question here, too, because there's been an arbitrary conversation around, well, by the end of the week, there could be details. That could still be true. Some of the negotiators, though, after they met today, kind of threw cold water on the idea that we were going to get details by the end of the week. I say arbitrary for these deadlines because that's what the negotiators have said. Chris Murphy, the guy who's leading the Democratic side of these conversations for gun violence prevention negotiations, say that, yeah, the end of the week would be nice, but at the same time, if compromised takes longer than that, they're going to take the time that they need. At they're this point, we're still kind of light on details, though. There's also this interesting piece of this, which you're seeing on the House tonight, right? One of the, the things they're suggesting is raising the age limit to buy a semiotic weapon from yeah. 18 to 21. You've seen some new Quinnipiac polling coming out that shows a majority of Americans, including a majority of Republicans, would support raising the age limit to buy certain guns. You have Senator Mitch McConnell, who, as NBC News is reporting, is privately telling colleagues he would be open to that move. However, he's not publicly lobbying for it, and there seems to be some real skepticism that that would end up in a final deal. That skepticism is completely warranted, because in talking with people who are part of these negotiations today, it seems like that conversation around raging, raising the age limit, even with people like McConnell privately expressing their support for it, that's not really on the table right now. Nevertheless, the House is going to do what they're going to do with it, but you spoke to the realities here. Just because the House does something doesn't mean the Senate does yeah. it. We've seen that time and again. Ali Vitali, live on the Hill, thank you so much. And tonight, as we talk about what happened in Uvalde, there is news there, too including on the police response that has left some people in that town furious over why it took so long for officers to get in that classroom and take out the shooter. You now have the U.S. Attorney General announcing new key details about what he describes as a transparent and independent review of the law enforcement response in that town. It's not a criminal investigation, but they're going to have a team of nine people looking at police policies, at communication, at how officers were deployed to rob elementary school. A.G. Merrick Garland saying the findings will end up in a report, which will then be made public. The review was actually requested by Uvalde's mayor. And we should point out here, it's kind of rare, somewhat, for the DOJ to be getting involved. Most reviews are conducted by local law enforcement agencies. We're also just finding out, really, as we were coming on the air, that tomorrow morning in Texas, state lawmakers there will hear testimony from law enforcement on that Uvalde response. We will see that. And it's all coming as the town continues to honor the lives of these children whose lives were stolen today. Ten-year-old Annabelle Rodriguez laid to rest. Guad Venegas is in Uvalde. And Guad, let me start with this DOJ review. Um, what does the Department of Justice hope to find, and what are you hearing from people in town about it? 
Uh, Hallie, well, yesterday the mayor spoke to the media and he said he was expecting this announcement to be made uh, today. So we know, as you mentioned, that these investigations are, lo are, are done by local authorities. We know that uh, Texas uh, state investigators have been on this from the beginning, but there's been issues, briefings that contradicted the previous briefings and people that just don't trust what they're hearing. Uh, so as you said, the, this uh, review has been requested and now the DOJ will be conducting the review. Now, the mayor of Uvalde also released a statement today uh, saying that the city will fully cooperate with the Department of Justice and will assist with coordinating whatever necessary, uh, whatever is necessary <clears throat> with local entities. They also believe, the city of Uvalde believes it will be fair and transparent. Uh, so I think people here just want more answers to the questions that they have. It's been over a week since we got a briefing from Texas state authorities. So we're all waiting for some type of official information uh, that could answer some of those questions as to why officers stayed outside of the school for so long, Hallie. Well, some Texas state lawmakers may get some of that information, Guad, potentially at this hearing we're just learning about tomorrow morning. Now, I say hearing, but I want to be clear. It's an executive session, meaning we could hear from lawmakers before and after, but we're not going to watch it. Like, we're not going to watch it happen the way we watched today's hearing in the U.S. Capitol happen. Um, but, but this is, it seems and feels like a, a key moment for lawmakers in the state of Texas to find out more, even behind closed doors, about what went down here. Hallie, so uh, Senator, uh, uh, Texas State Senator Roland Gutierrez is the one legislator that has been speaking to the media throughout this whole week. And in the conversations that we've had, he keeps bringing up uh, the officers. In the conversations we have, he always says, you know, I want to talk to the officers. It's really the officers that were here, that responded, that got certain instructions. They know what happened, and he's been wanting to talk to them. So now uh, we have this investigative committee that's going to be speaking to them. As you say, it will be private. But the the key to a lot of these answers is going to be to the officers and whatever it is they testify. Now, as you mentioned, we'll have to wait and see if any of these state legislators that will be in that hearing will be speaking to the media and releasing further details. But uh, a lot of the answers will be with these officers who were present when it all happened, Hallie. Guad Venegas, live for us in Ivalde. Guad, thank you. Late this afternoon. A man facing a judge was charged with attempted murder after police said he brought a gun near Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh's home and told them, allegedly, that he had the intention to assassinate the Supreme Court Justice. Authorities say 26-year-old Nicholas John Roski also had a knife, had pepper spray, had, like, burglary-type tools, stopped a block away from Justice Kavanaugh's house. He was arrested. Police say he came all the way from California with a gun in his suitcase. He allegedly told investigators he decided to target Kavanaugh because he was angry about the possibility the Supreme Court could overturn Roe v. Wade, that landmark abortion rights ruling. And he was angry about the school shooting in Uvalde. Kavanaugh lives in a suburb of D.C. here. His home has been the scene of protests after a draft of the court's decision suggesting a majority of justices would overturn Roe was leaked last month. I want to bring in Pete Williams. Uh, Pete, we know that this, this person called the police on himself. What else do we know about what happened? Well, I think you've sketched out the details pretty well here. The authorities say that uh, he arrived in a taxi cab, got out all dressed in black, carry a backpack with a suitcase in front of the justice's house and was witnessed by two federal marshals. Now, that's a key point to know that there is this expanded security at the justice's houses, which was stepped up in response to all the protests that you were just talking about. Then, according to the police, he walked a block away. That's when he called 911 and said he was having suicidal thoughts and that he came here to kill Justice Kavanaugh. He was questioned twice, once by, uh, Metro, uh, by Maryland police, Montgomery County police, and he told them that he's the one, that's where they got the statement that he was upset about the potential decision on abortion and possibly on gun rights. And then he told in a separate interview with the FBI, both times after given his Miranda warnings, that he wanted to kill the justice and then kill himself. Um, a couple of points here, Hallie. One is uh, the, 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 the uh, security around justices' houses has been stepped up. Merrick Garland did that. He talked about doing that today again when he was asked about this. But the second thing is there is a bill in Congress and has been for a while that would block the personal information of judges about their home addresses and their family members from the Internet. 
that has been stalled in the Congress. Apparently, Senator Rand Paul thinks it should go further than that, do the same thing for members of Congress. But let me just read you uh, an interesting line out of the court filing today against this man, uh, whose name is Nicholas John Roski. It says that he began thinking about this and decided he would come to kill the justice after finding the justice's Montcom Montgomery County address on the Internet. Okay. So this continues to be a, a pretty serious pr uh, problem. And that is why there has been, as you say, the response from the DOJ, but also some of the, the political reaction, too, as it relates to what you mentioned, this bill that the House has not yet passed that would extend security protections to justices. So there's two. One is the one that would give more uh, security to justices and their families. That's the one that passed the Senate and is blocked in the House. But the separate one that would keep this material off the Internet, that is stalled in the Senate. Pete Williams, live for us on that. Thanks for staying on top of that story for us, Pete, developing today. Appreciate it. We've got some more breaking news that's actually just into us now. Former President Trump and two of his adult children, Donald Trump Jr. and Ivanka Trump, set to testify in the civil investigation into his business dealings in New York. Basically, there is a date on the calendar now, right, after months of legal maneuvering from the Trumps to try to avoid this exact moment. It's going to be Friday, July 15th. That's when they'll start. They're hoping to finish by the end of the next week. Remember here, this is part of the New York Attorney General's investigation into the Trump Organization for a potentially basically illegally manipulating the values of real estate owned by the company, essentially a look into the Trump org's business practices. Tom Winter joins me now. And Tom, again, the, the Trump family have been trying to avoid this by, right. by saying legally they didn't have to and didn't want to do this, right? How is this going to work? These are going to be separate interviews, and it's not like we're going to get to watch them unfold live, not at all. Exactly, Hallie. The attorneys are invited, the Trumps are invited in separate interviews, as you say, but you and I and everybody watching us are most certainly not invited. This is going to be a deposition. It's not clear yet whether it's going to take place virtually, uh, you know, in some sort of a Zoom-type conference, or whether it will take place in person. We don't know the specific location or the timing of it, but we do know, from a standpoint of what hour of the day, uh, but we do know that both sides have agreed uh, that it should happen on July 15th, unless uh, the New York State Court of Appeals somehow comes in here and stays this, uh, if there's any sort of additional filing by the Trumps. To your point, this has been an ongoing battle, not specific to these depositions involving the former president, his son, Donald Trump Jr., and his daughter, Ivanka. His other son, Eric Trump, has already uh, provided a deposition to the attorney general's office. But there's been an ongoing battle uh, for over a year about the types of documents they needed to turn over, and then towards late last year, uh, out of public view. There was a battle as to whether or not these depositions should even occur, the Trumps fighting that. And then in February, a New York State Court of Appeals ruled that, yes, in fact, uh, these depositions should uh, happen. There were further legal battles, and then we got to where we are today, following the most recent court ruling, in that we have a date on the books, but again, with the asterisk that this could uh, potentially be pushed back further. But, uh, but it does appear that we're coming to uh, this kind of inflection point. Well, I'd like to pre-book you now for July 15th, Tom, to be on the show. So thank you in advance for your cooperation. <laughs> Appreciate it, friend. Thanks. So an NBC News exclusive now, the Biden administration looking to move migrants who are waiting for immigration proceedings out of border cities and deeper into the U.S., into some cities around the country, according to internal documents obtained by NBC News. So this is what's going to happen. It's going to start in Los Angeles, according to these documents. Other cities involved include Albuquerque, Houston, and Dallas. The Department of Homeland Security says the reason for this plan is to alleviate overcrowding along the border, where record high numbers of migrants have, in some places, overwhelmed the capacity of local shelters. Julia Ainsley is the reporter behind this scoop and so many others. She is joining us now live from El Paso. So, Julia, explain this reporting here and why it's so significant. Well, Hallie, right now I'm in a commissioner's courtroom in El Paso. This is a city that's had to deal with a lot of overcrowding when they get big surges of migrants coming through. Right now they're seeing over 8,000 a day. That's on top of the already record highs that we saw just last month. Here in El Paso, the problem is they don't have enough shelters to take in all those migrants. So what DHS, we understand, is now planning, and this hasn't been officially put in the works yet, but they're making contingency plans for the next surge to then be, start sending migrants 
immigrants away from cities like El Paso to places like Los Angeles, Dallas, Albuquerque, Houston, places where migrants could go by bus from the border and then stay in shelters there. Now, you might be thinking, don't migrants always end up inside the interior of the country anyway? And yes, they do, but they're the ones who, play, who pay for those bus tickets, for those plane tickets. In this case, it's trying to get them out of the border as quickly as possible so that for those who do qualify to make their claims before an immigration judge, then they go ahead and get out of the border as quickly as possible to prevent a backlog so that you don't have people sleeping on the streets in cities like El Paso. What do you anticipate the political fallout to this being, Julia? Well, Hallie, I would imagine that we would hear from Republicans who say, look, now the Biden administration is in the business of busing immigrants into the interior of the country and might say that this would signal an open border policy. But what I've been told by senior DHS officials is that it's not an open border policy. In fact, it's is trying to have a safe, orderly and humane immigration process, which was the president's first goal on this topic when he took office, although a lot of people might say that he hasn't lived up to that expectation so far. There's another piece of your reporting that I found interesting, um, a, a tongue-in-cheek reference to Texas Governor Greg Abbott, because some DHS, DHS officials are kind of sort of jokingly or teasingly calling this the Abbott plan. Explain that. Yeah, so if you remember, just a few weeks ago here in Texas, Governor Greg Abbott decided to pull what a lot of people saw as a political stunt by putting migrants on buses and sending them to Washington, D.C., just right outside the Capitol, trying to unburden his state of migrants and put them at the feet of Washington political leaders. Well, now DHS officials are saying, you know what? Not such a bad idea, Governor. We might do the same. We want to go ahead and pay for these buses, because we found that there were a lot of migrants who said, look, I'll take a free trip rather than trying trying to rely on someone in my family, trying to pull together resources to get to a final destination where I might be able to stay with my family and go before an immigration judge, why not take a free ride? And so that's what they're doing now, they're providing more free rides to cities across the country, Hallie. Julia Ainsley, live for us inside uh, one of the government offices there in El Paso, Texas. Julia, good to see you, thanks. Just within the last few minutes, we saw President Biden land out west to host a big summit, the Summit of the Americas, it's called. But for the next three days, he plans to focus on three big issues, the economy, climate, and what you just heard from Julia about, immigration. There he is. He's getting off the plane at LAX not too long ago. Later tonight, he's going to kick off his, his trip officially with a big speech. That said, it's a trip that's been, in some ways, a little bit overshadowed by some drama over who was and who was not invited for this summit. It's supposed to bring together leaders from North, Central, and South American countries. But this week, the Biden administration said Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela were not allowed to attend because they're not democracies. They don't respect human rights. Well, that backfired, in a way, because now Mexico, Bolivia, Honduras, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines all dropped out of the event in solidarity. Joining me now, Kelly O'Donnell in L.A., Ed Augustine in Cuba. And, Kelly, let me start with you in Los Angeles. There's a—let's not be unclear. There's still a lot of leaders coming, right, from Latin American countries, um, a number of them. There's also some who aren't going to be here. What is the message that the Biden administration is going to push, and how much is this, like, attendee drama taking away attention from the focus of this? Well, it is certainly the drama before the diplomacy, and the guest list has been fraught uh, for the weeks leading up to this, because the U.S. as host did not want to invite autocrats to attend a conference about these kinds of issues on U.S. soil. So that's the, uh, the snub coming from the U.S. to Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua. The other nations that, in sympathy to their uh, fellow uh, members of the Latin American community, said, that's kind of old thinking. There are too many issues at stake here. All all of the nation should be included are those that said, no, thanks, we're going to pass on this summit. But there are 23 heads of government that will be part of it. And once things get rolling and underway, perhaps the actual issues will take center stage, because they are big issues. And this is a summit that does not happen annually. It's every few years. And so these are issues that have been waiting for a moment uh, to get their time. And it was planned, and the U.S. became host long before we knew there was going to be a war in Ukraine, and long before we knew COVID was going to have this lock right. on so many parts of the world that it has had. And so uh, the Biden administration feels strongly that it should have a big agenda for its own extended neighborhood. So from uh, Canada all through South America, there will be a lot of important issues to discuss. But as the president just arrived, the buildup was a lot about who's in and who's not in and what those signals send. And as you know, there's also some speculation, and it's only that 
that at this point. Would the president at some point visit Saudi Arabia? Not a democratic country. And so there are some issues about is there an unfairness in the mm. approach of the administration? And that's one of the criticisms they've faced over this. The U.S. says it doesn't regret not inviting Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua and wants to stand for these democratic principles. Hallie? Kelly O'Donnell advancing President Biden out west in L.A. tonight. Kelly, thank you. Ed Augustine is joining me now from Havana to the reaction on all of this. So, Ed, what are we seeing and hearing from Cuba on this decision? Well, the Cuban government is clearly insulted at not having been invited, but I'm sure they're also simply delighted by the unprecedented number of Latin American countries that have publicly called on and pressed the United States to invite them to the summit. I mean, this has never happened before on this scale. As you said in your introduction, the presidents of Mexico, um, Bolivia, and uh, other countries are not uh, attending um, and have publicly said they're not attending because Cuba and other countries have not been invited. But, uh, as well as that, uh, the presidents of Chile and uh, Argentina, while they're at the summit, they also publicly called on the U.S. to invite all the countries of the Americas. Take migration, for example. Right now in Mexico, there are thousands of migrants on a caravan making their way up to the U.S. border where they hope to make it to the U.S. And according to some reports, the majority of those migrants are from three countries, Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua. Those countries aren't at the table, so they can't hash out the difficult issues of how to address dangerous, irregular migration that's, of course, a problem for the Biden administration with U.S. officials. Take health care, for example, which is another major issue that's going to be talked about at the summit. The island um, from which I speak to you is the only country in Latin America to have developed its own COVID vaccines. Over 90 percent of the population here has been vaccinated. And because of those vaccines, COVID levels here are very, very low. They've also sent hundreds of doctors throughout the pandemic to Latin American countries, many of those with those Cuban vaccines that have helped keep vaccine levels uh, less high than they, sorry, infection rates less high and less awful than they would have been in a lot of these countries with very low health care coverage. So I think the conclusion of many Latin American heads of state is that it doesn't make sense. It's somehow incoherent. It's odd to have a summit talking about the most critical issues of the Americas when the whole of the Americas aren't invited. Ed Augustin, live for us in Cuba. Ed, thank you very much. Let's get you over to the Ukraine now, where today the West is warning millions of people could die from hunger because Russia is refusing to unblock Ukraine's ports. Right now, you've got more than 20 million tons of grain basically being held hostage there. And today, the EU leader is calling this a cold, callous, and calculated siege by Russian President Vladimir Putin on some of the world's most vulnerable people. On the ground, you've got Russia still just slamming the east with attacks. But they're also now trying to make some moves in the south. Ali Aruzi is joining us now. And Ali, let me start with this port problem, right? Because this is having a huge impact on innocent people, civilians living in, you know, in the area and outside Ukraine. Is there a sense we might see a breakthrough anytime soon? Hey, Hallie, unfortunately, it doesn't feel that way at all. Look, the Kremlin is blaming Ukraine for a problem they created. The Russians had talks with the Turks today. They couldn't come up with an agreement how to solve this problem. There was no solution they could find there. The only plan they came up with is to hold talks again, and they couldn't even nail down a date for those talks. And look, the UN chief is saying that this blockade is causing an unprecedented wave of hunger and misery in the world. The food shortages are affecting 1.6 billion people across the world. He says if this goes on till next year, we're not talking about food shortages, but we're talking about starvation and famine. And just to put this into numbers for you, Hallie, uh, Ukraine ships out about five to six million tons of grain every month. Now that's down to a trickle, and it's affecting people from Africa to the Middle East. So this is becoming a very serious problem, but the Russians don't seem to be taking it seriously. It also comes, as we talked about, Russia is hitting the east still, looking to the south. What are you hearing from people where you are about what it's like right now? Well, Holly, we went to Borodyanka today, and that's uh, near the Bucha area where we saw those terrible crimes committed by the Russians, and they've just devastated the community there. Uh, we visited a 77-year-old grandmother called Maria. She was hunkering down in a shelter when the Russians were shelling that place. She was there with her daughter, her son-in-law, and her two grandchildren. Uh, when those Russian shells hit the bunker they were in, her daughter and son-in-law were killed in front of her. Her entire house was destroyed. Mm -hmm 
destroyed, her possessions were gone, and now her grandchildren uh, are in refuge in Poland, and she's been torn apart from her family. Let's take a listen to what she had to say to us. She lost her children, and she doesn't know how to live her life, and her grandchildren are small. So you, can you imagine what I outlived in the month and a half? Every day I was washing my face with my tears. And Halle, just walking around there, weeks after the Russians have retreated, the stench of death was still prevalent in that area. It was really very upsetting to see. It is upsetting to hear about, Ali, and upsetting that even, a, you know, 100 days after this invasion started, more than that, we're, we're hearing still these stories. Ali Aruzi, live for us in Kyiv. Thank you. Coming up, German police are looking into what happened in Berlin when a car drove into a school group in a popular shopping district. What we know about what happened coming up. Plus, dozens of women, including top U.S. gymnasts, names you know, filing a billion dollars in claims against the FBI. They say the agency botched its investigation into sex abuse by former Team USA Dr. Larry Nasser. We've got the details after the break. A group representing 90 women, including some of the biggest names in U.S. Olympics gymnastics, is filing federal tort claims, basically a big lawsuit against the FBI for the alleged mishandling of the Larry Nassar investigation. It's one of the worst sex abuse cases in U.S. sports history. Larry Nassar, remember, was the doctor for the women's national gymnastics team for 18 years, and during that time allegedly sexually assaulted at least 265 young women and girls. Back in 2018, he was sentenced to up to 175 years in prison for decades of sexual abuse. Well, now... The claims are being filed under an act which lets people who have been harmed by careless actions of the federal government to look for compensation. Issa Gutierrez has the latest details on this story. Over a billion dollars. That's what Olympic gymnastics stars Simone Biles, Michaela Maroney, Ali Raisman, and 87 other women's tort claims against the FBI amount to. The filing claims the Bureau mishandled the Larry Nassar sex abuse case that's made headlines for years. We suffered and continue to suffer because no one at FBI, USAG, or the USOPC did what was necessary to protect us. The majority of the women say Nasser abused them after he'd already been reported to the FBI in 2015, during a year-long period when no meaningful investigative action was taken. The FBI failed to do what they were supposed to do. One of the attorneys representing the women tells me today's legal action was months in the making, sparked after this Justice Department Inspector General report revealed that two FBI agents failed to respond to allegations by gymnasts that Nasser had sexually abused them with the urgency that the allegations required. The report also said one of the agents lied to the Inspector General's office about their actions. So when we got that report, we knew that we had to hold them accountable. Two months after the report came out, the FBI fired one of the accused agents. The Justice Department did not immediately respond to NBC News' request for comment. The FBI declined to comment and referred us to this congressional testimony from FBI Director Christopher Wray. There were people at the FBI who had their own chance to stop this monster back in 2015 and failed. Last month, the Justice Department announced the fired agent and his boss, who was also found responsible in the report, would not face charges. It's not just enough that they say that they failed. What value can you put on for being traumatized for the rest of your life? We have some people that are suicidal. We have some people that have been institutionalized. In a statement, Olympic gold medalist Michaela Maroney said it is clear that the only path to justice and healing is through the legal process. In 2017, more than 265 patients had come forward saying they'd been molested by the now-disgraced doctor. Nasser pleaded guilty to abusing 10 of them. He's serving 175 years in prison. Last fall, Raisman, Maroney, Simone Biles, and other gymnasts called on Congress to remove the U.S. Olympics and Paralympic Committee's board due to its mishandling of the abuse allegations against Nasser. The FBI, USOC, and USAG sat idly by as dozens of girls and women continued to be molested by Larry Nassar. To be clear, I blame Larry Nassar, and I also blame an entire system that enabled and perpetrated his abuse. The USOPC defended its handling of the case. Isa is joining us now. And listen, can, can you help us understand here, Isa, what makes this 
case different from, you know, similar claims or these kinds of types of claims that have been filed before and whether this could go to trial? Yeah, absolutely, Hallie. So back in April, uh, another 13 women came forward and filed similar claims against the FBI. Of course, what we're seeing today is 90 women, and again, including some of the most prominent names among the victims uh, of Larry Nassar. They're each claiming $10 million uh, in damages. As far as a trial uh, goes, something that uh, we're getting wrong here is that there's no lawsuit that's been filed yet, to be very clear. What happened today, what these claims filed did, was basically put the DOJ on notice. The Department of Justice now has 60 days to respond to these claims. They could say, we're going to resolve this for uh, through mediation, for example, or the attorney explained to me uh, they could not respond in that way, in which case a formal complaint will be filed against the FBI. That could then go to trial. He tells me, uh, the attorney representing the women tells me that he's confident that if it does go to a court, if it does go in front of a jury, that they will be able to prove uh, that there was wrong do wrongdoing here on behalf of the FBI. FBI, Hallie. Issa Gutierrez, thanks so much for that. Let's get you over now to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, police in Germany say somebody drove a car into a school group in Berlin, killing a teacher, hurting more than a dozen others. Officials have identified the suspect as a 29-year-old German-Armenian man who had posters in his car expressing some kind of views on Turkey. It's not clear whether what happened was intentional or not. We're going to keep an eye on this one. Number two, those primary results we talked about on this show yesterday are finally in in Los Angeles for that mayoral race. And it looks like Rick Caruso and Karen Bass are headed to a runoff election for mayor in November. Then in San Francisco, voters frustrated about crime rates recalled their progressive district attorney there, Chesa Boudin. And then in Iowa, Democrat Mike Frankel, Franken, excuse me, will face Republican Senator Chuck Grassley in November. That was an upset primary victory over Avery Finkenauer, although Grassley looks poised to hang on to that Senate seat overall. Number three, Walmart heir Rob Walton has agreed to buy the Denver Broncos for a record amount of money, $4.65 billion. That's the most ever paid for any sports franchise, $4.65 billion. The NFL still has to approve that agreement. Number four, reality TV stars Todd and Julie Chrisley have been convicted on federal charges, including bank fraud and tax evasion. A jury found them guilty of conspiring to defraud banks out of more than $30 million in basically fake loans. They'll be sentenced in October. Number five, Moderna says a redesigned version of its booster shot seems to give stronger protection against the Omicron variant than the current booster does. The company says the new vaccine targets two strains of COVID and is going to be its lead candidate this fall. But Moderna plans to submit data to the FDA sometime in the next few weeks. Still to come, the House committee investigating the January 6th attack, getting ready to roll out a primetime public hearing. We're going to get into what to watch for tomorrow, plus how we got here in the first place. That's our original right after the break. So tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And as you know, in just about 24 hours from now, almost exactly, actually, the House Select Committee looking at the January 6th is going to start its first in a series of public hearings expected to focus on former President Donald Trump and his alleged role in the Capitol riot. The committee saying it's going to present previously unseen material, new witness testimony. In other words, stuff we didn't know about before. And it's going to give us a summary of what it's found so far. But right before the hearings are gaveled in, we want to take a step back and remind you how we got here in the first place. It's a day that nearly brought America to its knees. <laughs> An attack on the Capitol after former President Trump's lies that the 2020 election was stolen. It was not. We're going to walk down to the Capitol. And we're going to cheer on our brave senators and congressmen and women. And we're probably not going to be cheering so much for some of them. Angry rioters clashing with police, <laughs> breaching the Capitol steps, going inside the building to try to stop the counting of electoral votes that would officially make Joe Biden the president. Five people died, two of whom were officers who died by suicide after the insurrection, and about 140 people were hurt, with one and a half million dollars worth of damages to the Capitol building itself. Across the country, shock, and at first, fury. And at the Capitol, a new committee created intending to investigate and report on what led up to what they called the domestic terrorist attack on the Capitol. The committee's creation, controversial, with many Republicans decrying it as overly partisan, 
and Democrats insisting it is a fact-finding mission. Ultimately, seven Democrats and two Republicans began their work in late July of 2021 with public testimony from four police officers who defended the Capitol on January 6th. We simply want justice and accountability. For most people, January 6th happened for a few hours. But for, but for, all, for those of us who work, were in the thick of it, it has not ended. Since then, the committee has conducted more than 1,000 depositions and interviews behind closed doors, received more than 140,000 documents, and issued 98 public subpoenas. Some complied with the subpoenas, like some members of the Trump family and former White House aides. Former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows did not testify at deposition scheduled by the House Committee investigating that Capitol riot. Others refused to testify, like former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows and former White House aides Steve Bannon, Peter Navarro, and Dan Scavino. All four have since been held in contempt of Congress for refusing to testify. Former Trump aide Steve Bannon indicted for contempt of Congress. Bannon and Navarro were also indicted by a federal grand jury for contempt of Congress, both refusing to provide the committee with documents or testimony. The committee, more recently, escalating its investigation by subpoenaing members of Congress. They just issued subpoenas to five sitting members of Congress, including the House Republican leader, Kevin McCarthy. But all five of those members have declined to testify so far. They're not conducting a legitimate investigation. It seems as though they just want to go after their political opponents. So what are the committee's big revelations to this point? First, text messages showed members of Congress, journalists, and even members of the president's own family begging Mark Meadows to tell former President Trump to stop the insurrection. Messages initially obtained by CNN. Second, the committee found a more than seven hour gap in White House phone logs during the riot when they know former President Trump had been in touch with Republican lawmakers like Leader McCarthy and Alabama Senator Tommy Tuberville. So that sets the stage for what we're about to see tomorrow. Saw Hokapur joins me now from Capitol Hill. It is a primetime hearing. It's going to be carried right here on NBC News now, anchored by Lester Holt. It's going to be across almost every other major network in prime time, except, by the way, for Fox News. This is a moment where, reportedly, by the way, a former TV producer executive is going to be, you know, managing, working with the committee uh, to, to put this on in prime time and for the rest of the hearings. It's a big moment for this committee because it is the very public revelation of what they've found so far. What do you know about this strategy here and whether or not this will meet the expectations that the committee has set so far. Well, Holly, the goal of the committee is to take Americans back to that day of horrific violence. And uh, they intend to do that with previously unseen material, as well as two individuals who had a pretty close view of that violence. That includes a documentary filmmaker uh, who was trailing certain individuals, including, uh, it seems, the, pr the far-right Proud Boys who have been charged with seditious conspiracy. Uh, this uh, filmmaker uh, was trailing them as the first, uh, the earliest moments of the violence began in the Capitol. And there's a Capitol Police officer uh, who uh, was trying to defend the Capitol complex from that violent mob who suffered a traumatic brain injury. She's going to tell her story as well. Uh, broadly, the committee is trying to reach a couple different kinds of Americans, including those who are sympathetic to their argument but may need a uh, refresher. You know, and uh, let's have a listen there to, uh, to that point, what Pete Aguilar, one of the members of the committee, had to say. We're going to lay out the, the evidence and we're going to lay out uh, the information that is before us uh, and allow people um, to, to ask that question uh, and to form their own opinions. Um, but that's the task before the, the committee. And then ultimately to produce a report. Uh, the level of accountability is, is on the Department of Justice. And part of what the committee expects to issue at the end of this, Hallie, is legislative recommendations on how Congress and the United States government at large can prevent anything like this from happening again in the future. We know that House Republicans are planning tomorrow morning uh, a news conference to presumably criticize what we'll be about to see tomorrow night in these primetime hearings. What else are you hearing about how, among the GOP, they plan to try to counter the committee's opening arguments here? That's right. We're getting a, a glimpse into the planned Republican counter-programming tomorrow, and that will include a uh, press conference led by House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy. It includes many figures uh, in the, the top echelons of the House GOP. They're going to be describing this committee's work as illegitimate and partisan. Let's take those one at a time. They say it's illegitimate because Speaker Pelosi vetoed uh, some of Kevin McCarthy's choices to serve on that committee, which resulted in him withdrawing all of them. Now, the reality is the statute makes very clear she has that uh, option to do that. 
And that language, of course, was cribbed from the Republican-created House Benghazi Committee back in 2014. Federal courts have repeatedly upheld the legitimacy, lawfully speaking, of these subpoenas. As for partisan, well, that's a back and forth conversation that uh, the two parties have been having repeatedly. Uh, the Democrats argue, Pelosi argues, that there are Republicans serving on this panel. It is bipartisan because Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger are members of the GOP caucus. Uh, of course, they were not chosen by the Republicans. They have criticized Trump. And uh, that's why McCarthy and his allies argue that this is a uh, partisan committee. Meanwhile, the, the official election committees of the Republican Party, Hallie, are not particularly enthusiastic mm. about getting involved in this. That's according to our colleague Scott Wong and Peter Nicholas, uh, who report that those committees don't believe this is a net benefit for the Republicans. They say it's not mm. for the Democrats either, and they prefer to focus on economic issues, inflation, gas prices, things that President Biden is struggling with right now. Saha Kapoor, I uh, hope you eat your Wheaties tomorrow, because I know it's going to be a long night for you and for many of, uh, many of our colleagues covering this. Thank you, Sahil. That includes, of course, all of us here at NBC News Now with our coverage of the January 6th public hearing right here, prime time, tomorrow, 8 o'clock Eastern, anchored by Lester Holt. I'm looking forward to joining my colleagues Chuck Todd and others for that coverage, too. To other news now, the pressure on right, to get Brittany Griner out of a Russian prison. But remember, the WNBA superstar is not the only American who is being held in Russia. Paul Whelan has been, too, since 2018, since he was arrested on espionage charges that he and the U.S. government say are false. And in a new statement today, his family says the Justice Department is not supporting the release of any foreign nationals in their custody to free Americans. NBC News has reached out to the DOJ for a response. They had no comment. Whelan was left out of a prisoner exchange in April that brought home another detainee. Remember, Trevor Reed. Whelan's sister told me last month that as happy as she was, as thrilled as she was for the Reed family, for her family, it was still tough to process. It was shocking when we heard the news in the morning. And uh, we got a call from the State Department letting us know that Trevor was on his way home, but Paul wasn't. And um, the, the thoughts that go through your head are myriad. I mean, we were overjoyed, of course, about Trevor, but I had to then call my elderly parents and let them know that their son was not going to be coming home. And that's the fear that Elizabeth Whelan is talking about now to the Associated Press, saying... She's worried about what happens, right, if Griner does get released before her brother. Of course, adding that, yes, obviously she wants Griner to be freed, naturally. The State Department has not said whether prisoner swaps are being talked about that could get Griner, Whelan, or both home, or whether they'd accept a deal that releases one without the other. Steve Patterson is joining us now to talk about this. And let me take this sort of Paul Whelan bucket first. He was not released with Trevor Reed. We now have, you know, a very high profile, profile push from basketball stars, from members of Congress who say we got to get Brittany Griner out of Russia. Is this an instance, do you think, where the Whelan family, and I've talked, as you know, Elizabeth Whelan, I've talked to the Reed family, like, yeah. what interesting to me is that the Reed family has said, like, they believe that shining a spotlight on Trevor's case helped get him out. And I wonder how much of this is Elizabeth Whelan and that family saying, hey, you know, don't forget about our brother and our son. Yeah, well, as you well know, it's a mess. It's like a back and forth. On one hand, these now near constant calls for Griner's release help elevate Whelan's case. Of course, gives his family a bigger platform and a bigger spotlight. But then on the other hand, yeah, his family is worried that he will be completely overshadowed by somebody that, let's face it, is far more famous, whose case was far more in the news and international news. You know, he's been in there, as you know, since 2018. Uh, after Reed's release, you can only imagine how devastated his family must have been. You can, you spoke to the family, and I think a lot of people have the expectation that Whelan is now and should be sort of next in line. But then others would argue that Griner hasn't yet been convicted in that country, and she's far more at risk for a number of reasons that we can get into. Uh, so to answer your question, yeah, I, I think the family just wants to make sure that Paul Whelan's name doesn't get lost so they can get him home as soon as possible, Hallie. Brittany Griner, so much public pressure yep. that started escalating once the State Department um, sort of changed the semantics in the way that they talk about her case. Um, and, and basically... It was seen as an escalation to try to get her out. Do we know um, that, that anything else, right, Steve, about this public pressure, what it might mean for the Biden administration to try to get a deal to get them out? We've heard from the administration before. They've you know, said, we listen, only... we're doing what we can. Go ahead. 
Yeah, sorry. Just that we only know what we've seen in the past. And it feels like yeah. for these families, in these cases, it is always the goal to get as much public pressure and attention as possible. And right now, this has really become a dinner topic. You mentioned earlier LeBron James, Steph Curry, the Boston Celtics are wearing T-shirts about it before playing in the finals. And I think there's a new awareness. People are understanding something else specific to Griner, which has nothing to do with her celebrity. One, that she's black. Two, that she's openly gay. And experts say in mm. Russia, those yep. two factors hurt your ability by a lot to find justice. So now there's this new time pressure push to get her home before she's unjustly convicted of anything. And again, it complicates everything with Whelan there as well. It's a mess. Allie. Steve Patterson, thank you for staying on top of this for us. I appreciate it. Yeah. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our Southeast Bureau, police in Florida have charged a man who they believe was behind a number of sex assaults back in the 1980s. How'd they do it? Really good DNA technology, apparently. It helped detectives link the cases of six women to this now 62-year-old suspect. He allegedly broke into victims' homes at night and covered their faces with pillows before assaulting them. From our West Coast Bureau, a home robbery caught on camera, a dash cam specifically. Police in San Jose released this video showing what happened when a woman turned into her driveway, opened the garage door, literally caught these people red-handed. She's like honking the horn. She's calling police. It was really scary. One of the suspects allegedly held her husband at gunpoint before taking off in that stolen car. From our New York Bureau, now. Disorder in a court in Albany Tuesday. Court officials say a clash broke out. A fight happened during an arraignment. Somebody released hundreds of cockroaches inside. That's right. Oh. The court said what happened was not activism, but criminal behavior meant to disrupt a proceeding. Who has to catch all those roaches, man? When we come back, Johnny Depp's lawyers speaking out, saying social media didn't really help him win his case against ex-wife Amber Heard. We'll talk about what's next for Depp coming up. He effectively won his case in court and on social media, but Johnny Depp's lawyers are saying all that online backup for their client did not really influence the case. Here they are on the Today Show this morning. It is everywhere, but at the same time, they were admonished every single night. And uh, they had a tremendous amount of respect, I think, for the court and the process, and they were doing the best that they could. Lawyers Camille Vasquez, you heard her there, and Benjamin Chu talking with Savannah about the case that found both Depp and Heard liable for defamation, but mostly sided with Depp, right? He was awarded more than $10 million in damages, while Heard got $2 million. Just last week, Amber Heard's lawyer, Ted, said on the Today Show, also to Savannah, that there's no way that jurors weren't influenced by social media. She says they may appeal the case. Miguel Almaguer is joining us now to talk all about this. And here we are, Miguel, you know, days after this, this result came out from this trial, we're still talking about Johnny Depp and Amber Heard because they're still talking about it, too. People online are still talking about it. His attorneys say, OK, it wasn't social media that won the case, but Depp himself. And they also blamed Amber Heard for the loss. Explain that piece of it. Well, so Depp's attorney says this all came down to honesty, and that's why they say Johnny Depp won the trial. In that sit-down interview on today, Depp's team said he was honest about his mistakes, including his drug use and even a series of text messages in which he attacked his ex-wife. Depp's team says while he was forthcoming on the stand, his ex-wife, Amber Heard, was not, and they say the jury could see that. And for that reason, that's why this team says Johnny Depp won in that sweeping judgment in this case, Hallie. There was also this interesting implication, as Depp's attorneys were kind of making the rounds this morning, that Depp may actually let Amber Heard off the hook for the millions of dollars that she now owes him. Explain that piece of it. Yeah, well, as you know, the jury awarded Depp $15 million in a defamation case against Amber Heard, but because of state limitations on punitive damages in Virginia, that dollar amount was actually lowered to about $10.4 million. But Depp's attorney says this, was, this case was never about money. Instead, it was about clearing his name. Now, Heard's attorney said the day after the judgment that she doesn't have the money to pay. Depp's team wouldn't say directly citing attorney-client privilege, but they seem to indicate that that full amount of cash isn't part of their plan to recover it. One of the big questions, um, Miguel, and one of the ways that I think we've talked about it and tried to frame it here on this show and, and elsewhere across this network has been about 
the, the broader implications of this case as it relates to domestic abuse and this question of whether this case has been a setback for survivors of domestic abuse, as you know. Before Depp's attorneys went out on TV today, a spokesperson for Heard said, and I want to read this, this quote, this statement here, that it is as unseemly as it is unprofessional that Johnny Depp's legal team has chosen to do a victory lap for setting back decades of how women can be treated in the courtroom. The, the statement goes on to say, what's next, a movie deal and merchandising? Talk about Depp's attorney's discussion here about the impact on the Me Too movement. Well, they were asked about that, and they were asked directly about the judgment being a setback for the Me Too movement. They said very simply it was not, and that in this case, it was about just this case. And that's what the jury, that's why they say the jury sided with them. They added that everyone should have their day in court, which they say is exactly what happened here, Hallie. Miguel Almaguer, we'd love to see you out in L.A. Miguel, thank you so much for being on the show. It's good to have you reporting with, with you. us. Appreciate it. That does it for this hour. Thanks to all of you for watching. We've got a big and busy day tomorrow. We're all going to eat our Wheaties, so we'll see you here, same time, same place. Coverage picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.